Hey, I'm Sarah Holbrook. I'm the executive director of the Pinhead Institute here in Telluride, Colorado, and the lucky interviewer of the mayor, Sean Murphy. How the heck Hi, are you, Sarah. Sean? Hi, Sarah. I'm very well, thanks. So Good happy to be to back. See you. Thank you. Yeah. And um, we've had two town council meetings since we last met up. True. And here's the other kind of big headline here in Telluride. We've had snow. And it's Gay Ski Week this and week. And it's Gay, gay so, Ski Week this week, yes. Uh, we could use more snow as always. But, as always, uh, yeah. But yeah. at least there's been some now, finally. No, I've been so out been the exciting. last couple days, and How's it's it been, been good. How's it been skiing? Yeah, yeah, it's been excellent. David Actually, Bill Jensen came to us. corduroy on uh, Bushwhacker the other day, said it was Ooh. great. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. My guests from Denver weren't up to go to nine, so uh -huh. we were playing around five and six. But so. it's nice that it's, you know, people can spread out all over the mountain now. Totally, All the roads are open, yeah. And having these sunny, great days that softens it up in the afternoon, so this is great. Yeah. What were you saying? Bo was saying. Bo oh, Jen Bill, D Bill Jensen, Jensen came to council owned, yesterday. He's one of the owners of the ski mountain. The CEO yeah. of yeah, Tell Ski. Yeah. Uh, he came to council yesterday. Actually, I wasn't here to talk about that, but he sort of was putting everything in perspective for us and telling us that they're basically in the mid 80s right now in terms of visitation. So they're off maybe about 15% uh -huh. in terms of number of visitors. Yeah. But their dollars for their food and beverage and their dollars for skier days are apparently they think maybe around 90%. Oh. So it's of what not they as were, bad 90% of what they were last weird. year. To date, yes. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. got it. So yeah. the news is not nearly as uh, negative as one might have assumed. Yeah, right, because it certainly wasn't 90% of the snow we normally get. That, yeah. well, it, it's 71% of the snow we usually get. Oh, okay. Not to be precise or anything, but yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not like you have a head for the numbers or anything. Um, let me ask you this. I saw in the paper, the lovely Telluride Daily Planet, that um, that it's not true that the Forest Service shuts down the mountain at the end of the season. I thought it was due to, like, Elks calving or something like that. Like after a certain point, you couldn't ski on the mountain because of the Forest Service. I think that's Untrue. an urban or a rural yeah, or a, a rural, micro town a myth, a ski a town myth. myth. Yes, exactly. Um, no, I actually asked Bill Jensen the same yes. question yesterday, mm -hmm. and he said, no, there is no requirement that they shut down at that point. Uh -huh. So I said, well, would you, I know the industry doesn't do this, but would you give consideration to not opening until Christmas and staying open through April? Yes. Of course, we'd have to ask nicely for our school to maybe put their spring break the first Later. two weeks of May. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, you know what? If the world is changing and global warming is impacting us, that oh. seems like a maybe a smart shift that maybe makes business sense as well as makes sense for the rest of us when we really get the good snow yeah, yeah. at the end of season. Uh -huh. But anyway, the answer was no, there is no contractual or other obligation for them to shut down at that time. Do they have to only operate for a certain number of days in the forest? Uh, my understanding is that I'm not necessarily limited in terms of the number of days they can operate, but they are limited in terms of the number of days they can make snow. Right, so there's that a 120 so I day stop, period. Yeah, they had to stop February 23rd, 23rd. or something You like got that. it. Well, you were I'm the, good with the dates. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're correct. They had yeah. to stop making snow the 23rd. Because so they had started. Fingers crossed. Yeah, lots of natural yeah. snow between now and, and uh, April 8th when they yes. close. Uh -huh. so, so it's a little bit later this and year. And next year he said they were staying open until April 7th. Right. And so they're starting later unless the snow they is They are going to open December 1st, yeah. he said. So, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, no, that's good, good information to have and we can all mm -hmm. hope for a better snow cycle and maybe more to come. Yeah, so. exactly. Hey, so tell me, what were the headlines from the council meeting yesterday? Well, it was all about housing. I hate to sound, sound like a broken record just from our last visit, but it was uh -huh. generally all about housing. I mean, mm -hmm. we've been, um, and this is really something that happens over a multi meeting cycle anyway. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, we actually gave final approval, the town council did, for the general contractor price that we received for the SMPA lot. So the AHA school and Correct. the 10 units uh -huh. of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. That project we have signed off now as a council. Mm -hmm. um, they have direction to go ahead and start the project. We will begin moving dirt uh, and, and the excavating in April. Uh -huh. So April and, 9th. Okay, and is it that the town is paying for the whole um, building of the shell, and then AHA is buying their part of the shell and building the interior? That's correct. Um, we're selling AHA School unfinished shell space, mm -hmm. approximately 10,000 square feet for about $5.2 million. Right, got it. And then we're and gonna take that money and use three million of it mm -hmm. to build the affordable housing program, uh, or build out the affordable housing segment of that mm -hmm. project. And we're gonna take uh, the, the remainder, the million, whatever, mm -hmm. and put it into the garage structure <laughs> investment for capital. Uh -huh. So. And how much is the total sign? You said you signed off on the budget with the contractor. What is that budget? Uh, we basically can borrow up to six million dollars. Mm. Um, we're hoping that we are not going to borrow quite that much. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe four point two, mm -hmm. I think, would be the draw that we yeah. take for the construction. Got it. So between the four point two and then the money coming in from AHA. 
there's your almost $10 million project cost. And that's so, what the project cost has been signed off for, is a $10, yes. $10 million project. And our voters, obviously, that includes the parking lot. Right. Our voters approved back in November of 2016 mm -hmm. the bond mm -hmm. that said, okay, we can basically take the revenues from the park, that parking garage and all the parking, uh, the, all the meters on Main Street mm -hmm. and lockbox that revenue and use it to pay off a bond that will finance the construction of the parking, partly. It seems kind of so, weird to me that the numbers work know, out, that a, you, know, you could pay $3 <laughs> to park at the curb for two hours or whatever and then that's somehow going to, <laughs> right, okay, yeah, $2 for two hours, and then that's somehow going to pay off a bond of a $10 million building? Does well, that not seem like an order of magnitude off? Uh, well, the $10 million <laughs> building, remember, we're only paying for half of that, right. mm -hmm. um, and so, and the remaining five, Believe it or not, you know this community purchased the, the um, car hinge lot mm -hmm. using that same bond source, uh -huh. and so we bonded for monies in those days, and we've used those parking revenues to completely pay off car hinge last year. How much so, did car hinge cost to build? Uh, I know it was before your I time. Think I can't we, imagine it was five million dollars. No, I think yeah. for the land over there, mm -hmm. we paid something around two million. Oh, okay. Uh, it wasn't so bad. It's, yeah, same order of magnitude though. And we actually got a yeah. grant from the Federal uh, Transportation Authority. The um, C no, not CDOT. Not CDOT, that's CDOT yeah. yeah. FTA, Federal Transit uh, Administration or Transportation okay. Administration. They gave us a grant, I think around four hundred thousand dollars, which is what we used to pave pave the yeah. parking lot at yeah, Car Hench exactly. to smooth it out and sort mm -hmm. of, you know, move around the rocks. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, no, that, you know, is a is another place where one day, hopefully 10 years from now, we'll be talking about housing and mixed use and all sorts of good things happening over there and maybe a more vibrant um, retail restaurant sort mm -hmm. of scene happening yeah. in that pocket. Yeah. Because certainly we could use it there. Yeah, exactly. The West yeah. End could definitely use more. The Pinhead so. headquarters is nearby there in the Cimarron building. And but to keep up with the housing message, yes, um, let's keep up with the we, housing we can message. stay at the West End. Uh -huh. And frankly, so we've heard about it, the SMPA lot uh -huh. slash the AHA School yes, joint venture so with the town. That's approved to start that's digging approved in April, April 9th. That's soon. So wow. April 9th, please don't be mad. But mm -hmm. we're going to close a portion of Pacific and a portion of Fur Just because don't drive. the Just, parking garage will yeah. extend under those streets. Yeah. And there'll be 70 spots there for the public to use, four I spots hope they have for the AHA School. In there we for are actually vehicles. our new town manager has actually been aggressively pursuing that. Fabulous. But if you need a charging station, you, we have Clark's, it. Clark's yep. and at Element Fifty Two. Yes, just don't so. charge during peak hours. I think that's between six and nine at night. Okay, it makes um, the electricity because that's too more expensive. expensive. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It bumps all the rate holders up. I mean, so it's do not your shopping just the at one in the afternoon yes. and come plug your car in. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So um, okay, so housing. But moving so that's to Virginia approved. Placer, yes. the other big headline that's happened since last we've talked, we had a lottery mm -hmm. on February sixteenth. Mm -hmm. We had. 81 approved applicants for 19 units, and of course all the units are spoken for at this point, although I heard one of the 19 dropped out and then PJ Kelly actually slid into number 19. Mm -hmm. So um, that's very good news for everybody concerned, I hope. Mm -hmm. And so the apartments actually will be available in, a, in April as well. Crazy. And then the boarding house will come online in May. Right. And the boarding and house, there'll be another, there'll be another lottery, lottery for that. Uh -huh. You got it. You're up to date. You could do the whole well, interview. Well, no, I just uh, I had a conversation with Chris Holstrom, and she was the county ah. commissioner that got Did to she drew you know, all pull the, the, the lottery balls, tickets. Yes. Yeah, exactly. For so the, it was a fair and fair and objective process yeah. with and nobody from town picking. And it was her idea, picking. I think, or she has been a big proponent of tiny houses. So I think uh, they were right. honoring her work in that field uh, when they allowed her to be the person to pick the names that would live in the tiny houses. You're I guess absolutely there's right. Three tiny and PJ houses. is one of the people that's going to ah, have one of the tiny houses. So yeah. yeah, I love that. Anyway. So yeah. that's what's happening in Virginia mm -hmm. Placer. So we are like sprinting toward the finish line. Let me ask you this. Can people still apply for the rooming houses or is that waiting list full? I know yes, that they're, you're, you're not, putting your names down and then they'll get pulled sometime between now and when they can move in in May. Mm -hmm. But um, are you still accepting applications for those now, for the rooming houses? My understanding is that Melanie Wasserman at mm -hmm. the Shanduka Rental Office, uh -huh. um, she can give you the further guidance. But yes, we haven't. This, the Telluride Housing Authority subcommittee, which is sort of working out the final terms of those leases, including the pricing and things like that. Um, they have not completed all of their work yet, so I believe they're having another meeting this Friday mm -hmm. at 1 o'clock at Rebecca Hall Green Room, yeah. uh, and you'll have some further discussion of both the guidelines which are in process, which I'll get to in a moment, mm -hmm. as well as uh, more Virginia Placer uh, detail. Uh -huh. But yes, we are planning on conducting a separate lottery for those 46 rooms. Uh -huh. So, sure. And the distinction there is some of them are singles, some of them are doubles, and so um, obviously I would assume most people who get chosen earlier on will pick the single option unless right. they've got a friend that they want to room with. Yeah, exactly. It's like but, college all over again. But those Do I will get be a single or a double? Six month leases, yeah. and so it'll be a different rental product than what we usually have here. Mm -hmm. um, we're really trying to target a different market segment. Um, and actually, back to the uh, SMP 
EPA thing, we're actually targeting a little bit higher income band. Mm. Usually the town does 80 to 120 percent of the area median income, yeah. which translates into about $60,000 for a household of two people. Uh -huh. uh, what we're doing at the, um, at the SMPA lot, the AHA joint venture, will there be 10 units for sale? Those will be targeted their between 95 percent of their sales. Okay, yes. mm -hmm. That committee just decided, okay. I'm not on that committee, but they just decided last week okay. that they would go ahead and sell those mm -hmm. uh, units. Sure. So those will be targeted to a little higher income band, 95% of AMI to 150% of AMI. Uh -huh. And this really addresses a huge gap that we have, and even 150 is not high enough in my opinion. We really need to be going to 2 or 250. But we have heard very loud and clear from a lot of people who are saying, look, I'm just barely above the 120% but I, yeah, but and I'm I priced out of affordable afford, housing. Yeah. And the gap between that and the market is just enormous. Yeah, sure. And so what we're really hoping to do is give some relief mm -hmm. to that group. And then I think you'll see a similar approach taken at lot B. Uh, when we finalize plans for the 16 uh, townhouse units next to Entrada, the okay. RV lot. Yes, got it. Exactly. But, and we saw the story polls out there just a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh -huh. sure. So that covers the SMPA building. That covers Virginia Placer. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's really significant that we did yesterday after a series of three meetings mm -hmm. was we adopted a 600% increase in the affordable housing mitigation fee for new construction, residential new construction. Okay, we talked about that last time, and we yeah. talked about it for a long time. Is there any way you can try to it's summarize very... it in a few sentences. Let me try, yeah. and then you can tell me that I'm wrong, Perfect. and then you can correct me. Something like, if you build a structure or add to your existing structure, you used to have to put a certain amount aside, some percentage of the job, to affordable to the affordable housing fund, and now that percentage will get to be a bigger amount. Right. What we did was adopt some new, include some new variables mm -hmm. that push that fee up, and mm -hmm. those are where the devil is in the details. But mm -hmm. frankly, what we did was make four adjustments, mm -hmm. and thereby we raised what would have been $12,000 for a 4,000 square foot house, let's say, a new build, to now 72000 so okay. we've taken it up 600%. So six times, yeah, six times. exactly, exactly. So that was determined yesterday. Mm -hmm. We'll come back and look at that. We should be looking at that every single year. Mm -hmm. um, and so there were some you know, people who wanted to be more aggressive and to push it even higher. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly, those arguments should be made and had, and that yeah. conversation should be had. But you know, one of the things is when you're going from zero to 60 or zero yeah. to 600, um, mm -hmm. do you want to push people to 600% or do you want to push them to 1,000%? Right. And that's really where we were trying to compromise mm -hmm and split the baby, yeah. so to speak. But this is That's something hard. that really the that past town councils have really taken no action on since 2009. Right. When it the other it stayed formula the same was established. formula for a long time. Yeah. Exactly. And part <laughs> one of the inputs in that formula is a per square foot price to build affordable housing here. Mm -hmm. And we were you know, down at like $248 or something. Mm -hmm. And we pushed that to about $453, I mm -hmm. think. So we're trying to be more in line with market reality. Mm -hmm. But we're also trying not to steamroll or to, you know, disadvantage too many people because frankly there's about 21 percent undeveloped land here and so if you're going to build a house you're now going to be subject to that and so we right. didn't want to really really overly uh, Load penalize the system, the, yeah. and just target a select few what we're also going to do is mm -hmm. we're going to investigate ballot language to go to the voters for an increase in property tax mm. that would go exclusively for the benefit of affordable housing. Ah, As okay. you now know, we have a half a cent sales tax that mm -hmm. funds our affordable housing fund, yes. uh -huh. but we don't have direct, you know, segregated property tax component that's devoted to that. Okay. And what we really teased out in this whole discussion over mm -hmm. three meetings about the affordable housing mitigation fees mm -hmm. apl applicable to new residential construction right. was we really have a situation where we want to spread this burden across everyone. Mm -hmm. We don't really want to be laying it all on the shoulders of 21%. Yeah. And so if we, we can do that. 21% because that's the land that's, that's available. available. That's what you're saying. Got and it. Mm -hmm. Now you could, Kathy Green will tell you that developable land where you could tear down non-historic structures could push you more in the range of 80% of the buildings in town could be, crazy. you know, scraped uh -huh. and something new put up. Mm -hmm. So in any because regard. Because only 20% of the town's building stock is, uh, is Well, historic. there's only 20% like vacant lots in uh -huh. effect. 20% of the lots uh, that the total lots in town uh -huh. would are available right now right. could be built. No, I get that, but on. you're saying that Kathy says that if you <coughs> included all the all the houses that could be knocked down and rebuilt, it's houses it goes and up to commercial 80%. buildings. Yes. So what you're saying is of of the existing buildings in Telluride, 
only 21% of our entire land is covered by historic buildings that can't be knocked down. Approximately 20%, yeah. yes. Wow. That's right. So, We're doing a lot of math today. I know, this is, <clears throat> this is way too, it's too, did I mention too pin heady and did stem Did I mention that pinhead is stemmy and stemmy. there's the M in stem for math? Um, okay, it's so your, we, It's your necklace. It's I know, like pushing exactly. Us it's toward very, that. yeah. This necklace, Cognitive. however, is steam. And, and speaking of steam, we're doing a cool class right now with the AHA school. Um, I think it's on like light properties and stuff like that. So kids use light and art and science. It's going to be fabulous. It's happening. So right the now. last of the four yes. things, the mm -hmm. All About Housing list, uh -huh. is the Telluride Housing Authority guidelines. That's something we've been working on for about six months now. Mm -hmm. And so we've we've held two public fora. The uh -huh. last one was February 20th. Is fora the plural of fora? I believe it is. Well yeah. done. I don't know. We could look yeah. it up. Somebody no, I don't really us. care that much, but uh, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> it's um, not STEM. When was the last time that this Housing Authority guidelines was um, overhauled or over, you know, looked looked over very carefully? 2016. We, oh, so we every should two be years. doing this every two years. Okay, that's not my, bad. Inform, my understanding is that it apparently hasn't been on that strict a schedule, mm -hmm. so there have been greater gaps greater than two years mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. But since I've been around, we've done it in 2016, we're doing it again in 2018, and we'll be doing it again in 2020 if okay. I'm still around. Okay. But anyway, someone will yeah. carry that process forward. Okay, and but so what's the, the idea headline is from that? We have made a number of changes addressing some of the tensions that have been highlighted in the last two years in terms of controversies or exception applications that we've had that we've heard a number of a certain kind and then we say, well, should we adjust the policy to be more responsive to that kind of fact set? And so we've really moved through now an exhaustive analysis and actually um, you know, there are three members of this committee plus a plus an alternate, and everybody has been very focused and, and keyed into doing this. So, mm -hmm. what we want to do is we'll have one more meeting this Friday, uh, the second of March at one p.m. at Rebecca Hall in the Green Room. That's the Telluride Housing Authority subcommittee meeting. Okay. At that meeting, we will be hopefully finalizing all of the proposed changes to the guidelines, and then taking action as a subcommittee to recommend those changes up as a group, uh, as a subset, up to sure. the council. Sure. So then then presumably at our March 20th meeting, we'll all the the whole town council will then pour over this whole the red line mm -hmm. and figure out okay yes 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 or yeah we love everything or no our constituents are telling us no to this and no to that but it yes to everything else. Mm -hmm. But I really think that what we've teased out in the last two public meetings has been um, on these guidelines specifically is really that people are very concerned about things like um, if you bought your town construction or if you were able to acquire your town constructed unit through a lottery, uh, we will going forward require you to not the people who already did this, but the people who got it by lottery will have to resell it through lottery. Mm. That's been a real criticism that's come through because the system now is if you had obtained your unit by lottery, you could request them to do another lottery, but more oftentimes you have a friend who wants your unit and, and you, you end up... And you just pass it along, yeah. yeah. So there's been some concern and some outcry about that, and then there was pushback among people who are currently owning that receive their units through lotteries that said, no, 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 we want to pick our friends. So we sort of... Oh. We sort of are splitting the baby and saying, okay, if you're already in place, you can choose for the next sale. Uh -huh. Then whoever comes after you has to abide by the default rule that it's going to go back in the lottery. Uh -huh. I guess the idea is we want to provide the greatest number of people the, the most opportunity for you know sure. for these units. Yeah. So that um, that's one of the things. One of the other things is we have this ongoing debate really and this is a this is something people should focus on and pay more attention to um, we have a whole group of people here who effectively can telecommute and mm. so and many of them have been here for a lot of years mm. and so now there's a situation that's developed where in 2016 we put in a quote-unquote presence requirement yeah so you're working your work yeah. you, you need to be present in the town of Telluride in order to perform your job right and so some people will draw a bright line and say hey if you're um, you know, if you're doing an internet-based sales business or something, you don't need to do that. If you're consulting and your clients are all over the world, you don't really need to be in Telluride. You can mm. be somewhere else. Yeah. So that's a fundamental question. Should we be um, letting that kind of a work uh, of a worker mm. uh, qualify for affordable housing? So we were talking about people who are telecommuting. Right. So there's a certain group of people in town who telecommute. Then there's a certain other group of people in town who are, let's say you're an, a, a CPA or if you're an attorney. Um, do all of your clients live in Telluride? Mm -hmm. Do they have to? Yeah, well, under the presence requirement, strictly applied, mm -hmm. there could there would be a year-by-year x-ray of all your clients, and mm -hmm. if you had too many clients, 
out of district in effect, or any clients for whom you were performing services that were out of the R1 school district, mm -hmm. they won't count those hours towards your employment hours. I and get if it. you're an owner of a de-districted unit, you need to have 1,400 hours of employment. Uh -huh. So this could put certain people in a, dis, you know, a very disadvantageous position, mm -hmm. and this can happen every single year. Wow. So you may be fine in 2017, but boom, 2018, because of your client set, over which you don't have a lot of control. Right. We don't want people to say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to serve you. you don't, you're not within the R1 school district. Right. And then their income goes from, let's say, 60000 to sixteen. Yeah. You know, that's not, that's not realistic. So, so what, that is the, tension what is the is, feeling about most of the people who are going to be making this decision? Um, that they should adjust the rules to allow those people as residents, um, you know, it's hard to say. Do you um, feel like it's going one way or the other? When is this going to be decided? What we've tried to do is balance the balance these, you know, the tension here. Mm -hmm. And so what we've asked our um, council to do, Lois Major, who works for the Housing Authority, um, we've asked her to draft kind of a policy statement that says, okay, here's the general rule, presence required, but here are some factors that, you know, let's say you have a small mom and pop business small mom and pop law firm. Your, your registered office is in Telluride. Your only office, physical office, is in Telluride. You've been here for 10 years. You know, let's say you've served on P&Z in the past. You know, do we want somebody like that to be pushed out? No. So we've tried to collect a subset or sort of a set of factors that needs to be looked at in case you have to come for a hearing exception, mm -hmm. in case upon the x-ray process of your client hours, right. you somehow fall below the threshold. So what we're trying to do is at least be cognizant and we're also thinking, look, there are probably a dozen people who could be kicked out of affordable housing right now if yeah. you were to apply the rule as written strictly. Mm -hmm. So that's not our goal. Right. Um, we, you don't want to kick them out. We don't want to kick them out, uh -huh. but we want people to be compliant, and so we want to figure out how, how to change the ruling how to, or the wording so that they can be compliant and still exactly. do the things that they're doing that right now. So are, that's the do that's to be that that's uh -huh. the other headline that's been percolating at the subcommittee level uh -huh. that really people should focus on, should give thought to, and frankly should come to the March twentieth meeting or write to us or call us okay, that's and express March, their opinions. That's March 20th. Those that's not guideline March amendments. 1st, I mean, March 2nd? Didn't you no, say there was one March on Friday? March 2nd is the subcommittee meeting mm -hmm. at which the Telluride Housing Authority subcommittee will make a recommendation on a package of, of proposed changes to the guidelines. Got it. Then that, those proposed changes will go up to the full town council on got March it, 20th. On March 20th. Okay, so got it. So March those 20th are your is particular the, dates. Yeah, the yeah. dates. Yeah, exactly. So, so th you are that more, rounds out housing. Well, yeah. no, but you also said that there was something about the the spot the development that was on the hill. Okay, so here's here we're going to pivot into yeah. land use code and yeah. potential we'll just, approval of Yeah. Right. We don't need to get in the weeds. There's a big development that's being proposed it's or called has it Windhorse. been approved. It's called Windhorse. It was uh -huh. approved after about a year and a half at the Planning and Zoning Commission level. Got it. The Planning and Zoning Commission, the P&Z, uh, gave their ap approval of the the preliminary plan, mm -hmm. they gave that on December 14th. Got it. There was a 14-day period following that for any member of the public to lodge an appeal or for any member of town council to ask for, uh, two members of town council minimum, to ask for a call-up of that process. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That simply means, hey, we want to take the um, authority away from PNZ. We want to revest it in town council because it is, after all, our authority. Uh -huh. We just delegate it you know, normally to PNZ and delegate other authority to HARC. This happened, I think, with the transfer warehouse. Correct. Yes. So that was probably one of the last call-ups we had. That yep. was a few years back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you're right. So the process there is any two town council members who choose for any reason at all, there's no requirement under the municipal code that anybody give any reason. As long as two of the seven say, hey, we want to pull this up, we want to review this, uh -huh. um, that did not happen. So oh, neither a call-up was um, lodged nor was an appeal lodged. Okay. So here we are at the end of February, and we've gone through two meetings now, our February 6th meeting and our February 27th meeting. Mm -hmm. And or sorry, 7th and 28th, yeah. uh, respectively. And so what we did was we were reviewing what they call a right-of-way dedication. This really has nothing to do with the subdivision approval, which they got from PNZ. Mm -hmm. This is something that was related to that because in order to cluster this housing density down in two, you know, in one pod at the bottom of the hillside, thereby leaving more open space, mm -hmm. they received. Um, they were told, okay, you can squeeze all this stuff together, but guess what? Pinion and Laurel and other roads come up through that mm -hmm. and now they're going to go up a, a slope that's quite steep so sure. the likelihood of us ever using or building on that not real high yeah. so what we did was as part of the PNZ approval PNZ recommended that town council approve these quote-unquote right-of-way vacations where uh -huh. the right-of-way could have accommodated our street 
So what we have considered in the last two meetings is, strictly speaking, the, the four corners of, of that, up, of that um, action item, mm -hmm. uh, we were kind of having council members who wanted to go outside those four corners right. and revisit this whole topic about, do we like this subdivision grant? Do right. we like you know this, that, and the other? Or did the town get enough in the bargain? And that's already that's a been P and Z determined. level yeah. determination. That's, that's already determined. So right. We, yeah. And if we didn't feel that P and Z had extracted a good enough bargain, then, then we should have called it up, or someone should have appealed but it. But none of that happened. None so of that now happened. All there, all, all that's within these four corners in this box talking about that development is the right of way and vacation. Right. Okay. Exactly. Now, and did in, that pass, in exchange or? for doing it, it did pass. Mm -hmm. In exchange for doing that. Um, what we received as the town was they gave us not only an open space dedication, which I think they would have had to have um, given us approximately 26,000 square feet of open space mm -hmm. because of the overall size, the, the land use code rule is, if you're gonna do a, a development, you have to give the town 10% ah, of the okay. land. Sure. So in our case, we would have been entitled to about 26,000. When you moved all the housing and clustered it at the bottom of this overall lot, mm -hmm. Then the land, the, uh, land use, the land dedication to the town became 145,000 square feet oh, of wow, open really space. Really so we, we yeah. basically got five times as much as what we would have had. Uh -huh. um, but there was controversy. And what people also did not um, maybe grasp immediately was not only did the town receive this open space <clears throat> as a dedication, but the town also received a portion of their lot that creates three town owned lots ah, right okay. along their little road that the town okay. could sell for a million dollars each ah, or, or the town could build duplexes could, yes. on each of those so ah. we could get six units of affordable housing let's say yeah. on those three get, lots or we could monetize them for yeah, three million and go buy a lot yeah. where we could build 20 or 30 units got it yeah so that'll be a discussion for another day mm -hmm. but what people need to make sure they keep in mind is the bargain quote unquote that p and z struck back in december mm -hmm. was to allow for this larger open space dedication mm -hmm. plus town that plus land mm -hmm. on the edge of this development that's that's um, adjacent to town to one town owned lot right now yes. where we actually were able to get and we can make three lots out of that nice so that's a three million dollar benefit plus how can you put a price on open space but right it, it's a uh, and it keeps the housing as close to the existing housing pods right. as possible yeah which makes sense so, in terms of density and flow and all of that and then there'll yeah. be a trail that will go across through that open space mm -hmm. and actually you'll have then the public being able to come up right along their new little road mm -hmm. to access that trail and then that trail will also go up above and access another trail above uh -huh. so there are public public benefits to be sure and frankly, I would would hope people would focus on, wow, we now have a $3 million asset. Yeah. What can we do with this? Mm -hmm. Do we want to build six units? Do we want to buy something else? Yeah. How many units are going to be in that development? Not the not the town-owned area, but the There but are the 20 developed. lots. Okay. And one of the other points that, not to get too bogged down in this, but one of the other points made was three of those 20 lots, the developer, in effect, voluntarily deed-restricted to be available only for people who live here full-time. <gasps> Um, and so we have, quote unquote, three local slots. Yeah, sure. It's not the same deed restriction that we have with our housing authority deed restriction. Uh, because this is a private developer deed restriction. But again, I mean, think about this. This really fits into that bucket of the gap. Mm -hmm. Anybody above 150% of AMI and can't afford a $3 million 25 by 100 foot lot mm -hmm. with an old house on it, yeah. that person can buy one of those lots and build. Yeah. So um, you have at least three more opportunities if you happen to be in this, maybe you're more successful, you and your spouse or partner or whatever, um, have the ability to spend, let's say two million, not three. Yeah. Maybe you can then move into one of these. Mm -hmm. So sure. I think it really gives, um, it's one of the, it's part of the all of the above solution that we should focus on, not mm -hmm. we have to have one size fits all and therefore we leave out a bunch of people. Right, right. So Got that's it. the Windhorse development. So okay. that was approved on second reading, which means we're done with that. Okay. Um, they can go back to P&Z now and get their final approval mm -hmm. and that'll be that. Okay, good. But we've done, we've done what, we's, what was asked of us, which was to look at this very circumscribed mm -hmm. uh, set. Yeah, the access. The, the right of way. Mm -hmm. Sure. Let's talk about sales tax and real estate transfer tax. What's the money looking like? Uh, that I don't have for you. Uh, this oh is the first time goodness. ever I know. You told me I was the numbers guy. and then I know, you're the numbers oops. guy. What the heck? Um, 
Well, I can tell you that through the end of 2017, uh, I know we said this last time, we basically found well, ourselves. That it's new information all over again. Tell us what how it looks from the end of uh, 2017. Sales tax was only up about 4.2 percent for all of 2017 versus over all of 16, the year before, which is and it good. Was up maybe seven percent the year before. That's so, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So we re that's really the the average rate anyway. If you Four. listen to Todd Brown who keeps all this data on restaurant and retail and stuff going on in town, over like a 20 year period, the average is really four or five percent. Yeah. And so, and when we were budgeting last year, last fall, we said, you know what, we were assuming a five percent increase, let's push that down. Oh good. So we only assumed a four percent increase, which kind of matched up with what our revenues were anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's what we assumed was gonna happen in 18. Mm -hmm. Now who knows what'll happen. We've had maybe a little slower winter. Mm -hmm. If Telski is off by almost 15%, then right. I would assume that our January and February sales tax revenues are gonna be about that much lower. Yes, although in December, I remember, even though the, the mountain was experiencing some serious um, cutbacks, helped it helped, yeah, yeah. town People sales tax. People didn't and, ski, they came yeah, to town and came, dined and ate. shopped. and. Yep. Yep. and enjoyed life, yes. Yeah, so maybe so it won't be down as much. We just feel like because of people's, you know, let's say your January and your February schedule is much more around, should I do a trip with my kids around President's Day? Mm. Mm, yeah, but I'm gonna go to Montana. I'm not Got gonna it. go to Telluride. Mm -hmm, so sure. we're feeling like that is where we're gonna hit get the hit. Yeah. So yeah. January's numbers became available February 20th. So okay. my bad, eight days. We should have had that information eight <laughs> days ago, but uh, you'll get it next time. There's we promise to give you the update. There's next always time. a next time. No one's perfect. Yeah, well, close but not. Yeah. Um, so, what else do you want to talk about? What haven't I asked you about that you're interested in? Gosh, well, you know what? The other kind of interesting thing we had a work session yesterday um, mm -hmm. about the adjustments potentially to our land use code and our municipal code for marijuana related businesses. Yes, to see if they can stay open later for one thing, right? You might recall that back mm -hmm. in December, we had a work session and we had um, actually much greater turnout at that work session than yesterday's work session. And we had a number of the retailers come to us and say, they were pushing, for example, in December for we'd like a limit, a cap on the overall number of retailers. And really we listened to a, a bunch of different arguments and then that wasn't the only thing. We were considering hours of operation, mm -hmm. what sort of employee background check information would be fatal or not to mm -hmm. someone seeking a job mm -hmm. in one of those establishments. And we also thought about, okay, what, um, you know, what are the things that the state has now evolved on? Um, do we want to just mirror? Mm -hmm. And so the takeaway really from December and again from yesterday is that we've given direction to staff that we would like them to not circumscribe the hours. Mm -hmm. Let's just use the state thing, which is 8 a.m. to midnight. Okay. I don't think anybody's going to stay open till midnight. Yeah. But there was a lot of um, outcry from the existing retailers that said, look, we, we were forced to close at 7. That's mm -hmm. the rule we adopted in 2014. Mm -hmm. And now, reality is a lot of people go to dinner and they get out of dinner at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. Yeah, they wouldn't mind shopping. They wouldn't mind shopping for those yep. products, and mm -hmm. so we don't allow that at the moment. Mm -hmm. So what we said was, and this is kind of my thing, I think we shouldn't treat marijuana much differently, if any differently, than alcohol. Mm -hmm. And we do not require our liquor stores to be closed at 7 p.m. We don't right. require, require them to be closed any time before state law says. Mm -hmm. State law will say midnight. Right. So we're basically following state law in the context of marijuana uh, retail sales, just the way we follow state law in the case of alcohol And that hasn't sales. been adopted yet, but it's being considered. It hasn't been right? adopted. Yeah. What happened was our, from the December work session, we gave direction to our town attorney. Mm -hmm. He came back to us yesterday with, with a markup mm -hmm. of the municipal code showing these proposed changes, mm -hmm. and then also asked us, you know, okay, would you like us to specify a closing time or yeah. not? Got it. And so we, we looked at a draft in effect of what it will look like. We're also taking some things out of our municipal co uh, land use code mm. and putting them in the municipal code because that's not necessarily the right place for them. Got um, it. We were trying to, you know, catch up and, and to get ahead of the curve back in 2014. Mm -hmm. And now that we've had a few years of experience, we mm -hmm. actually feel like, okay, that's more logically placed in this code, not that code. And we'll go ahead and actually conform to what we think is best practice and what is the state law. Got it. So. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. We could be more restrictive because we're a home rule municipality. What does so that mean, home rule? Home rule means that we are effectively like a, uh, except for certain issues, the state can't tread on us. Mm. And so we have more authority and most like San Miguel County is a home rule county. Okay. So it's basically an opt out mm -hmm. from being a statutory municipality or a statutory county, which means you're governed by more of the state law. Got Here, it. there's a more limited set of state law that applies to you, mm -hmm. and you as a community can choose to be more restrictive. You can't be in conflict with state law, or, mm -hmm. or but you can, mm -hmm. you can adjust. What's the term again? Self rule. 
Uh, home rule. Home rule. Home home rule. rule. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have other things that you wanted to talk about? Because no, that brings really me to my question. You know, so we had ahead. this terrible tragedy with the with the Florida shooting. Um, I've heard my kids who are in the public schools say that you know you read the headlines and people are suggesting that teachers get training with firearms and that every school has an armed security guard. And a number of the teachers have said, well, if that happens, unlikely that it will. I think maybe it's just something that they're saying. But if that happens, they would you know, quit, stop being teachers. Teachers can't be expected to also carry firearms and be trained in situations like that. Is there some way that Telluride could adopt a stricter gun policy? That's a good point, yes. Mm -hmm. I believe the answer to that is yes, because we actually have had this come up in the past. I believe that, was it NUCLA? Mm -hmm. Requires each <laughs> citizen to own a, yes. a firearm. Yes, exactly. And at the time they were considering that legislation, which I think was back in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, I vaguely remember that. There's a great um, article on The Guardian about that if you want to Google that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not that long Just ago. like they can do that, mm -hmm. we could say, we could put more yeah, restrictions. Yeah, no automatic weapons. Or, I mean, a lot of people hunt. You couldn't ban uh, right. firearms, but you could cert I, I mean, but one thought would be restrict right. the type that you have access to or are allowed to own in this town. Well, I don't mean to wade into a hot topic, but, you know, the Second Amendment does say well-regulated mm. militia. What do you yes. think well-regulated means? Yeah, probably there, no stock. <laughs> <laughs> there are regulations that are envisioned and are, are c c completely appropriate. Mm -hmm. So, frankly, I think that we could certainly give some thought to that, mm -hmm. and we should hear from our local community. Mm -hmm. um, I don't personally own a firearm. Mm -hmm. My sister does. My father did. Yeah. And so I don't All have a problem with people owning. Yeah, yeah, my sure. dad was a duck hunter. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. and my sister had a home invasion, so she owns a Glock. Wow. So um, I personally wouldn't want to take that step. I have two step. dogs, but, but yeah, let's not regulate dogs Yeah, yet. standard poodles make really good watchdogs, too. So <laughs> They do. They tell you when anybody's showing up. It's true. Up. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we, um, yeah. Uh, mm. You know, anyhow, it's not it's an just, easy thing, but it could thought. be something yeah. where Telluride could, you know, just like we try to do in the in the environmental context, yeah. we could try to make more of a statement in that area. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage people to let us know if that's what you want us to do. Yeah, there we go. I have no more questions. All right. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you, Sarah. Always a pleasure. Always. I feel like I really know Thank what's you. going on in town now. Thanks so much. No, likewise. Take, Take care. care.